Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome back Amy Baxter. She's a pediatric emergency physician. She's the CEO of Pain Care Labs. Today's Kevin MD article is titled, Misunderstandings About Opioid Use Disorder. Amy, welcome back to the show. It's great to be back. I'm hoping to become a longtime friend of the pod. Fantastic. And to hear Amy's story, go to kevinmd.com slash podcast, upper right-hand corner, search icon, click on that, search for her previous episodes to hear her story. But today, let's jump right into your most recent Kevin MD article, Misunderstandings About Opioid Use Disorder. Tell us how this article came together. Well, I have a very good friend from high school who overdosed on heroin when I was in my second year of college. Mm-hmm. And I was furious with her for for two decades, three decades, didn't go to her funeral, just how could she be such an idiot? And now that I have been working with NIDA and am funded to reduce opioid use by giving alternative methods for pain management, I have learned so much that just makes me really want to explain to people what we know now. And if I'd known it then, I might have been able to keep her from dying, but certainly it would have replaced my my anger and disappointment with empathy and understanding. All right. So tell us, what have you learned? So there are about 10 genes now that have been identified with different neurotransmitter processing. So dopamine is the one that everybody's going for to make you feel great. That is the reward. It's not really novelty. It's more mastery. It's more feeling empowered And so most of the substances that people take are modifying the the dopamine pathway. Now you've got other pathways, but, you know, serotonin, oxytocin, feeling loved, feeling all these things. Well, it turns out that people who are the first time they misuse opioids, there are really distinct differences between people who go on to get opioid use disorder and those who don't. And all this stuff is in the past five years or so. Mm. So it turns out that there are about 14% of people that will get an amazing reward sensation from opioids that they often haven't from anything else. Their dopamine reward systems are deficient. And so whether it's that they're, the dopamine they're making isn't striking the, the mu receptors enough, whether it's that they're not receiving the dopamine that's made as well, but they, they are not getting as much of a buzz from normal activities And so when they take an opioid, they have never felt that great. They have never felt that warm, loved, happy, et cetera. So when people take opioids from medicine cabinets or their friends' medicine cabinets, um, which is about where 60% of opioid use disorder starts, that first reaction really is genetically dependent and it's very predictive. So in my article, I I use the ones that had the highest p-values from these two people who didn't and people who did develop opioid use disorder. And and it's really stunning how like 96% of people who develop OUD feel relaxed and fluid in their movements. Mm. What? I don't know. How weird. But that's that's something that is the most predictive. And then are most highly correlated. And then the other ones are things like, you know, I felt, I felt loved by everybody. I felt comfortable in my own skin. I felt all these things when I was practicing and had one of the best trauma nurses I've ever had, they ended up becoming an opioid use disorder, addicted to fentanyl, stealing it from kids. Mm -hmm. And it started with a gallbladder. And so I asked this person later, how on earth did somebody who was one of the best trauma nurses I worked with, how did this happen? And he said, you seem comfortable in your skin. You seem happy and you know, you're loved. And I never felt that until I took that first opioid. So all of this is to say that first of all, the family history, which is what we use now is, is really a genetic history. Mm -hmm. You know, so compelling. It's so much stronger than any other kind of substance in terms of how it rewards you that, that introducing opioids to the opioid naive is going to carry risk. And the other part of it is that, you know, my friend was, was adopted and she didn't, she was a chain smoker in Kentucky where I grew up. And I 
didn't realize how much there's an overlap between the stimulation from nicotine and the this this opioid this reward deficiency. So there was that. And and if I'd known she was adopted, you know, kids are often given up for adoption for a reason. She probably had a family history of this this genetic predisposition to substance abuse. And knowing that probably could have warned her, probably could have warned her parents. And that whole cascade of suffering, if we know that a large number of people are going to respond differently, then we can identify them early. We can say, okay, you responded with euphoria to this first pill that we gave you. Let's find different alternatives. So you mentioned that I don't remember the number you said about 15% of people have this reaction, this, this reward deficiency that gives them that euphoric response whenever they, they take an opioid for the first time. What, what are some other responses in that spectrum of, of genetic variations to responses? So there's the euphoric one. What are some other examples of genetic responses to first time opioid use? You mean like the like things to watch out for? Yeah. Uh, slurred speech mm. was one that was much more mm. likely in those who went on to get a opioid use disorder. Being afraid that you'd never feel this happy again. So, mm. you know, again, this sort of transcendent feeling and wishing that everybody could feel this good. So it's it's a lot of superlatives. But I think that the slurred speech was one that was was also a really stuck out to me as as a, an objective sign that someone else could look at and and see. And the thing is, I think we're we're still in a nascent place for this. We can't this this in my article, I I cite the people who have this list of 10 different genes. And so while they've narrowed them down, there's also genes for depression. I mean, genes for ADHD. It's really all of these attributes are so if you're if you're ADHD like me, you mate. And so you keep doing more extreme things or more frequent things to get the same reward sensation as somebody else, then there's all the whole axis of depression where it's really a, a serotonin deficiencies. And sure, we use reuptake inhibitors, but they're also different things that if you know that this genetics is there, then diet changes, other things. But I think that that all of those together go back to my initial reason for doing all this and writing all this, which was to to overcome some of the residual damage that the Sacklers and Purdue Pharma left with us. We started looking at pain management as the goal is pain-free, the answer is a pill, and opioids aren't addictive. And so now we know that they are addictive, but we still don't really understand the degree to which there are risks. And as we're quantifying those, we have left this big dearth in but what do we do as an alternative? Sure. So a lot of that is is very neurotransmitter based. You know, like there are serotonin activities we can do that decrease pain. There are oxytocin activities after a surgery or something like friends and family and faith and those things we can do to decrease pain. So we've we have and we need to limit opioids even further, but we're still believing what the Sacklers told us, which is, or the Purdue Pharma told us, is that pain-free is still the goal and a pill is how we get there. And I think that that's, that's part of how we need to disabuse this mm -hmm. because so many people get opioid use disorder directly from their friends and family's medicine cabinets. That if we throw away those pills, if we quit prescribing those pills, then we'll turn off the faucet of new opioid use disorder. But the, the subsequent correlate is we, we have to understand pain better so that we can do that ethically and provide other alternatives. So you're saying that some people are so genetically predisposed to opioid use disorder that even a, a perceived minimal dose of opioids, like a, like a Tylenol number three, that could set them on a path to opioid use disorder just because of their genetics. Actually, yeah. I mean, it's it's not it's the thing is it's not a necessary condition, but it can be a it's not it's not a, a sufficient condition, but it it can be part of the necessary condition. If you never it is necessary. If you never take an opioid, then you're not going to get addicted. Okay. So it's the the fact that for some people, 
Interestingly, actually, there's another study from 2008 that asks people who are on chronic opioids, who do have opioid use disorder and who don't, what they remember from their first time taking it. And the ones who don't have opioid use disorder don't remember anything special. The ones who do remember this euphoria. Hmm. It's like eight, uh, 16 fold more common that they res- remember this euphoria. So if we can avoid, even in the, the emergency departments, if we can avoid something that makes them feel that way, then that's important. Now, I think that opioids during surgery, when you're out, I don't think that's a risk. In fact, there's many studies that show that the amount of morphine in the first 24 hours after a trauma or a burn, those reduce PTSD and chronic pain. So I think that that some of what's going on here is that it's complicated. We have, there are places where the, the IV opioid receptors are useful and are distinguished from just relief of pain. That was one of the places that got that 14% because one article looked at euphoria versus relief of pain in people with long bone fractures who had never had opioids before. And 86% of them, it's just relief of pain. But that 14% was also joyful, fantastic, just giddy with how much they loved the world. And that's different. Now, how would we even screen for something like this? Do we simply ask qualitative questions like, did you get euphoric at, you know, whatever scenario? Do we quantify by measuring neurotransmitters? How? What's your approach to screening for something like this? Yeah, I, I am the messenger. I, this is not my area of research. It's just what I've started to to read about in, in trying to understand how the the downstream effects of pharma that can be a good idea at the time end up having problems. I imagine ultimately, I mean, like, so there are people who cannot process toradol into an active mu receptor form. There are people who cannot process codeine. So these are cytochrome P450, 2D6, different genotypes, and we can screen for those. The flip side of that is there are people who who metabolize them so quickly that it may cause them to get a rush. It may not just be a dopamine thing, a dopamine receptor. It may be that they're metabolizing it so quickly they get this whoom hmm. um, that we can screen for, and it's it's just a matter of prioritizing whether we do that or not. But here's here's one of the things, Kevin. So, for example, little example, the there are a lot of people now who are using the buzzy device, pharmaceutical companies that are using it in their CROs to do PK studies to see whether or not their site reactions are pain. But downstream, once it's approved, they're not making those things that got those results available to the patients. And so the FDA and pharma companies have, you know, they approve the safety just within this narrow period of time, but they don't look at what is it long-term that's happening. And I think that the FDA is particularly starting to realize and starting to look at some of these specific items that, that, okay, if we're going to do this, we do need to be testing. You know, it's not just an efficacy downstream. It's also a, what are the unintended consequences that are not related to what the labeling is? So I think that that's that's incumbent. I mean, if you're going to put put a medication out there, you need to know what the long-term effects are. I do think we'll be screening in the EDs. I do think there's there's now after the the TED talk that I did on pain and opioid use, TED pain brain hacks, go find it. It's good. But after that, the NIH, one of the things that TED did was they they said, hey, you talk about this euphoria. Where's your your data on this? Because you know six percent of kids who had their wisdom teeth out got opioid use disorder within a year. So I showed them that paper, and they said, "But yeah, tell me about the the euphoria part." And there actually was very little that was published. So National Institute of Drug Abuse now, because of that, I went back to my contacts at NIDA and I said, "Hey guys, this would be a great area. What are we doing?" And it turns out they're they've got an RFA now, a request for applications now that is asking about pre-addiction and studies looking at what happens before you get OUD. So I think that we now, there is an area of research push for this. We've got some retrospective studies looking at the different characteristics. We've got some genetic studies. I think we'll be starting to put those two things together to get us a better way of identifying this going forward. We're talking to Amy Baxter. She's a pediatric emergency physician. She's the CEO of Pain Care Labs. And today's Kevin MD article is titled Misunderstandings About Opioid Use Disorder. So Amy, from a broader standpoint, what is the general 
reaction to your findings that there is a genetic predisposition predisposition to opioid use disorder? Yeah, well, it's not my findings. I am a, a collator, but not that's not my area of research. But I think that the general reaction is that people are so used to hoarding a few extra opioid pills in their cabinets because we've we've built it up as being the good stuff. You know, we've built mm -hmm. it up as this is the way for pain. So when people find out that opioids actually just activate the reward center, they're they're making you not care about pain, but they don't impact pain. That's a huge surprise to a lot of doctors also. So I think the reaction now is is starting to realize that the the way that we process opioids and the the differential risks again emphasize that we're the only country who has this problem and our our solution that we're trying to solve with opioids post op pain most of our problem with opioid use disorder is directly coming from prescriptions for post op pain either directly or left in medicine cabinet. So I think what people are realizing is even more, I really do need to throw away these leftovers. The leftovers are making kids feel like these pills are benign and familiar. So when they're laced with fentanyl, which is now one in four of overdose deaths is from a fentanyl laced pill disguised as a Percocet, disguised as a Tylenol number three, that familiarity is, is causing part of our opioid crisis and deaths. So I think with all of this together, it's it's a rising awareness that pain is what we need to address. These pills are the problem, not the solution. And that they're hopefully people are realizing that the, the predisposition to becoming hooked on a powerful reward is really out of people's control. The best way we can control it is to not let that exposure happen. And my final question, Amy, tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. All right. Throw away the pills in your medicine cabinet. Use other neurotransmitter-based pain relievers, um, which would be activities and different physical and fear-reducing and control-increasing options. And go watch the TED Talk with the uh, pain hacks for additional ways. Instead of using opioids, use options. Amy, thank you once again for coming back on the show and sharing your time and insight. Thank you for the forum and for making a place where doctors can spout off and be collegial and uh, seen.